Carbohydrates come in different structures, different monosaccharides, and different connections between those monosaccharides. In this unit, we'll talk about carbohydrate structure and why that's so important for understanding the digestion, absorption, and metabolism of carbohydrates. We're going to talk about why it's important for understanding its digestion. We're going to talk about the three classifications of carbohydrates. We're going to talk about the configuration of the glycosidic bond and go through some examples. And then we're going to discuss the major storage forms of polysaccharides and how understanding their structural differences explain differences in their nutritional biology. The most basic unit of a carbohydrate is a monosaccharide, and the three most important monosaccharides for human nutrition are glucose, fructose, and galactose. If these are consumed, there's no need to digest them. They're already monosaccharides, and they're already ready to be absorbed. However, if they're combined in chains of two disaccharides, or longer chains, such as polysaccharides, we need to break them down in order to absorb them. But what about sugars? What is the difference between a sugar and a carbohydrate? All sugars are carbohydrates, but not all carbohydrates are sugars. For example, polysaccharides are not considered sugars. Sugars are the monosaccharides and disaccharides that are available for us for energy. Added sugars are defined as those monosaccharides and disaccharides that are added as a sweetener in other food products. If you look at nutrition facts labels, you can see that carbohydrates are broken down into total carbohydrates, dietary fibers, total sugars, and then added sugars. Sugar-sweetened beverages comprise of about a third of total beverage intake in the United States. This includes things like soda, iced tea, and energy drinks. They comprise a very large proportion of our dietary added sugars, 50 to 60% in adolescents and adults. These are considered to have a very low nutrient to energy ratio. What that means is they have a lot of calories, but without any other essential nutrients. Sugar-sweetened beverage intake is associated with obesity, diabetes, and liver disease in both adults and children. So as such, there are recommendations to limit the amount of sugar-sweetened beverage intake in both children and adults. Limit added sugars, not total sugars, to less than 10% of your energy intake. So what does that look like? If we take the recommended energy expenditure for a woman, 2,000 calories a day, take 10% of that, that's 200 calories. We know the at water factor for carbohydrates is four calories per gram. So 200 calories divided by four is less than 50 grams of added sugars per day. There is also a more general recommendation to switch beverage choices to those with a higher nutrient to energy ratio. Going back to monosaccharides, there are two important ways by which we can classify monosaccharides. The first is the presence of the double bond O group, either an aldehyde or a ketone. The second is the orientation of the hydroxyl groups. First, let's talk about the aldehyde or ketone group. Shown on the left is fructose. It's a ketone. Shown on the right is glucose, which is an aldehyde sugar. As you can see, for glucose, the double bond O is next to a hydrogen group. However, for a ketone, it's next to a carbon group. Another important characteristic is the position of the hydroxyl groups, the OH groups. Glucose has hydroxyl groups going on the right, then left, then right, then right side. Glucose and galactose differ only by the orientation of the fourth hydroxyl group. In glucose, it's on the right. If it switches to the left, you now have galactose. It may seem like a subtle change, but glucose and galactose are metabolized completely differently. They use different transporters and are catabolized by totally different enzymes, solely on the basis of the position of that hydroxyl group. Another way to think about the structure of carbohydrates is whether they're in linear or cyclized forms. Sugars can switch back and forth between cyclic and linear forms. A free monosaccharide such as glucose can cyclize around to the left to form alpha glucose or around to the right to form beta glucose. These chemical structures are the same. They just depend on whether the chain turned to the right or turned to the left. In blue is a really important carbon on the glucose subunit. It's called the anomeric carbon. In the alpha form, when glucose is cyclized, you can see the hydroxyl group is pointing down whereas in the beta form, it's pointing up. Again, this may seem like a very subtle difference, but as we'll learn, the position of that hydroxyl group is extremely important for understanding the digestibility of a disaccharide or polysaccharide. Glycosidic bonds join monosaccharides. They're important for forming disaccharides and polysaccharides. The name of the bond is based on the direction of that hydroxyl group that I described before. 
If it's in the alpha orientation, that means the hydroxyl group is pointing down. I remember this by thinking alpha, anchor, down. If it's in the beta orientation, the hydroxyl group is pointing up. I remember that by beta balloon up. That's one part of a glycosidic bond naming. The second part is which carbons are actually connected and what number are they? There are three major dietary disaccharides, maltose, lactose, and sucrose. Let's take maltose first. Maltose is a disaccharide that contains two glucose subunits. It's commonly found in sweet potatoes, barley, and corn. They are connected by an alpha-1,4 bond. Shown in the yellow boxes are the anomeric carbon on the glucose on the left, that's carbon-1, and then the number 4 carbon on the glucose on the right. When it's connected, that's going to be a 1,4 bond, based on the number of those carbons. Since the hydroxyl group of the anomeric carbon on the glucose on the left is pointing down, remember anchor down alpha, that means it is an alpha 1,4 linkage. A second disaccharide that's very important in human nutrition is lactose. It's commonly found in milk, milk products, infant formula. It comprises of a glucose subunit connected to a galactose subunit. Its linkage is a beta 1,4 bond. The anomeric carbon of galactose is in beta orientation, beta balloon up. You can see that hydroxyl group on the number one carbon on galactose is pointing up. That makes it a beta bond. It is connected to the number four carbon on glucose. That makes it a beta 1,4 linkage between glucose and galactose. The third disaccharide that's important in the human diet is sucrose. It's commonly found as an additive as cane sugar is made from beets, sweet peas can be found in fruits and molasses. In this particular case, the anomeric carbon of glucose is connected to the anomeric carbon of fructose. Since the bond comprises of two anomeric carbons, we have to describe the orientation of both hydroxyl groups. Let's start with the glucose perspective. It's in the alpha position, alpha anchor. As you can see, the hydroxyl group is pointing down in glucose. That makes it an alpha-1 linkage. From the fructose perspective, it's in beta orientation. That hydroxyl group is pointing up from the number two carbon. That makes it a beta-2 bond. Therefore, the sucrose glycosidic bond is alpha-1, beta-2. Polysaccharides are the major storage forms of carbohydrates in both plants and in animals. The common storage forms of carbohydrates are all polyglucoses. What that means is they comprise of long chains of glucose. And there are three different forms that are important for us. One is starch, which is a combination of amylose and amylopectin. One is cellulose, and one is glycogen. Since all of these are polyglucoses, what they differ is where the glycosidic linkages are. And as we'll see, these glycosidic linkages mean that polysaccharides behave very different in a nutritional context. Shown on the left is glycogen. It's the major storage form of carbohydrates in mammals. It comprises of mostly alpha-1,4 glucose linkages. Those are the linear chains shown on the left. However, every once in a while, a glucose also has an alpha-1,6 bond. When there's an alpha-1,4 and an alpha-1,6 bond, then there's a branch point. As you can see on the picture on the left, there's multiple branch points in glycogen. Glycogen is highly branched, and that's efficient for making sure that glycogen can be stored in a very compact, water-soluble form. Amylopectin is quite similar to glycogen. It comprises of alpha-1,4 linkages and the occasional branch point, which is an alpha-1,6 linkage. Amylopectin differs from glycogen in that the amount of branching tends to be substantially less. Amylose and cellulose also contain only glucose. Amylose contains alpha-1,4 linkages exclusively, whereas cellulose consists of beta-1,4 linkages. Remember, the only difference between amylose and cellulose is the position of that hydroxyl group. In the amylose example, it's pointing down, alpha anchor, and in the cellulose form, it's pointing up, beta 1,4. Again, this may seem like a subtle difference, but in the case of amylose, amylose is extremely digestible by most humans. It's a major source of glucose from foods. Think of things like potatoes. On the other hand, cellulose is completely undigestible. We cannot break it down at all because we cannot break down beta-1,4 linkages, whereas we can break down alpha-1,4 linkages. That makes cellulose function as an insoluble fiber in our digestive system. In summary, understanding the structure of monosaccharides is important for understanding their absorption and their ability to oligomerize. The classes of carbohydrates are defined by the number of monosaccharides and their glycosidic bonds. 
the glycosidic bond depends on the sugars that are connected, the carbons, and the direction of the hydroxyl groups. The storage forms of carbohydrates that matter for human nutrition include glycogen, starch, and cellulose, and they're defined by their different linkages of glucose. 